we're going to talk about hyperconvergence, okay? Yay. What is that market uh, buzzword? Uh, so we're going to look a little bit into it, okay? So the cheesy line is cook your way to a hyperconverged open stack because we use Chef. So that's why you're cooking. You're using recipes, you're using Chef. Haha, <laughs> okay. So let's move over. Uh, this is the agenda. We're going to just provide a quick introduction then to what is hyper. Yeah, okay. Uh, into uh, what is actually hyperconvergence, uh, an introduction to OpenStack and uh, storage, the architecture that this is, and, and just a quick demo of how this thing that we're talking about uh, actually looks like. So, Intro into hyperconverts. The promise is a software defined data center. It's to integrate virtualization or virtual networks, storage, and compute. Hyperconverged infrastructure is a promise to flatten that infrastructure. Again, compute, network, and, stor and, and storage because it lowers complexity because it helps lower cost, it makes us more efficient, and it's just sc scalable. So, you know, did I just copy paste this from somewhere else? Uh, maybe, but what does it actually mean? Lowering, com lowering complexity. If you have HP servers across the board, or if you have a single model of Dell server, Ingr Supermicro, anything you want, the actual fact of um, updating one BIOS, one uh, storage controller version, one firmware, the fact that you can simplify infrastructure just makes everything way easier. When you need new parts, same hard drives, uh, same controllers, same servers, so you can actually simplify everything. Now. I said hard drives, but actually hard drives is a bad idea. You want to have um, a mix of hard drive vendors. You don't want to have seven different versions, but you probably want to have two or three. Now, what is the promise? What, what does it mean if I have really a hyper-converged environment? Uh, I need to have a, a unified API. Uh, one place where I do centralized operations. So operations management is in one place. I'm not going into different places and just doing crazy stuff all over. It's an all-in-one storage, compute, and network in a single box. If I need more resources, I grab, I buy another box, I plug it in, and it behaves the same as the other 20 other systems I had. Uh, we use Standard commodity hardware or enterprise standard hardware. Um, every component is highly available or always available. Our storage is replicated, it's a scale out, it, it actually scales. Um, and with this, we have a, scalar, a scalable architecture. We're going to go into a little bit uh, later into what that means. But these are the checkpoints you need to go through to see, yes, okay, I can say I have a hyperconverged environment. Um, these are some of the guys out there in the market. What are they doing? Um, so there's simplicity. So they tell you, look, I took a server, a storage switch, uh, an HA shared storage, the SSD array, backup appliance, one optimization, cloud gateway, put all the stuff from your switch into a diagram and then put a really nice thing here and then that's what they sell. So they simply put every single service into a, into a unified platform um, and this is their hyper-converged appliance. Um, there is those little boxes up here that they don't talk about normally but that you need. This is the operations management and the actual management framework that they need in order, in order to orchestrate whatever is inside the simplicity box. 
Sublimity just has actually one architecture and it's pretty much their own. Um, then we ship into uh, Nutanix um, where they have, um, they're open about the hardware architecture. So Sublimity is their own appliance. Nutanix actually has uh, a way to distribute either a Dell or a Well, with Nutanix, you can use uh, Dell hardware, you can use HP hardware as well. Right, which is which I believe is a Dell box. Yeah, yes. Right, so, but that actually, that reference architecture they have depends on the hypervisor of your choice. So if, because they provide either VMware or their, or you could use Hyper-V or Nutanix, which is a word for not saving KVM. At the end of the day, it's KVM, you know, that thing we've been shipping for a while. Um, then they have an abstraction layer for storage, which is, uh, Ice, Ice Cozy, SMB, who hasn't heard of that, and then NFS. Then they provide virtual machines on top of that. That is their distributed storage fabric. Uh, now their storage, um, the criticizing point, I guess, or the negative point where I've actually read online about uh, that problem, you can go to storagereviews.com and look for Nutanix, you're gonna read it yourself uh, and find out that they actually have a scalability, a scalability problems when um, we're talking about storage. Uh, the cool thing from them is again, there's choice, right? We like choice. Hyper-V, their own KVM or a VMware. Again, they also have that own hyper-converged appliance, but they do have some management software there that's out of the equation. Then uh, there's VMware, of course. Now they, they jumped into the hype and vSphere, vCenter, and vSAN. Um, this actually works pretty well. Uh, when you start looking into the industry center hypervisor, who's ever got fired for using ESXi or, or VMware? Nobody, right? Um, vCenter, really, really, uh, really pretty unified management platform. And then there's vSAN. Uh, vSAN, just like with Nutanix, it's actually, it, it actually doesn't scale very well. Um, it, they're starting to work on that, but the feature uh, set, it's actually um, not quite there compared to the other vendors. So if you look at vSAN, uh, they actually provide iSCSI, SMB, and other protocols. Uh, vSAN is VMware. It talks VMware. It talks to VMware ESXi. That's, that's what it does. So if you want to use that storage for anything else, you can't. You're only using VMware. Okay, so those are the three most popular uh, hyperconverged platforms or appliances you can go out there and talk to and, and purchase. Um, but let's talk about uh, an open architecture. Let's talk about open source. Let's talk about no vendor lock-in because with the other three options, you bought them, you're married with them, their management framework is their management framework. Nobody else sells what they sell. Okay, so you guys know SUSE. Uh, we've been here for 24 years. Uh, we had the first open stack distribution. We have over 7,000 certified applications, 5,000 global partners. We're, that number is actually way higher because I think that's what we hired this year. <laughs> um, and uh, two thirds of Fortune Global 100 runs on, runs as well, so is the Enterprise Linux. 
So let's actually talk about uh, OpenStack Cloud. This is a fast and easy uh, OpenStack to deploy. So we provide a framework where you do drag and drop of your nodes that we actually provision. And there you go. You have an OpenStack deployed on premise. Uh, rock solid reliability. Why does hypervisor support? Because we provide Zen, KVM, Hyper-V. We actually can talk to VMware and we talk to ZVM as well. Best inter interoperable because we actually support if you want to bring in a Red Hat virtual machine or an Ubuntu virtual machine or a Windows virtual machine, we're not going to go like, no, you're you're breaking the whole supportability of that host, which other vendors would do. Um, we're, of course, uh, business-oriented and have a different life cycle for OpenStack. OpenStack releases every six months. We don't shove a new release of OpenStack every six months because the business can't upgrade that frequently. We do that every year, which is actually a pretty good thing. And of course, we provide non-disruptive upgrades. That means that across your virtual machines, when you're doing that upgrade from OpenStack 6 to OpenStack 7, your virtual machines will not be impacted. The networking, the virtual machines themselves, anything with regards to production would not be impacted. We're foreseeing probably like a 10 minute downtime at the actual management dashboard frame um, when you do the upgrade from six to seven. But your workloads are, are not, not going to be interrupted. Uh, so, what is Suzy OpenStack Cloud? And with OpenStack, normally you hear, so who knows some OpenStack? Who has heard? Okay, you've heard Cinder, Glanz, Neutron, all these freaky names, but you have no idea what they mean. So I've, tried, I've, I've translated it here. So, compute, software-defined networking, object storage, data processing as a server, as a service, this is actually um, uh, Hadoop, Splunk, or I'm sorry, Spark as a service. Uh, an app catalog, so that you can choose from a, from a catalog of applications and deploy them. A self-service dashboard, bare metal provisioning, or in the uh, terms of OpenStack Ironic. Uh, pluggable authentication, that means you can hook up to, uh, if there's anyone there, e-directory. Uh, or Active Directory, LDAP, you name it. Um, there's also partners that do um, two-way authentication uh, or two-level authentication. Block storage on demand, uh, our Crowbar, which is our uh, SUSE OpenStack Cloud Operations Manager. So you have a dashboard to actually manage the entire cluster. Uh, within a centralized tool. So we don't call this operations manager, but that is what it is. And when I say operations manager, everyone pretty much understands what it does. DNS as a service, so you can actually have control of your DNS zone. Containers as a service, telemetry of all these resources that you're con um, consuming, a template repository, database as a service. We have a partnership with Tesora that actually takes care of a more professional uh, database as a service approach uh, because that's what they do. Um, then a secure key uh, uh, value service, a service orchestration, a file share as a service as well. So you can create, if you want to create an NFS, because you're used to using NFS and you want to share services across um, virtual machines or because NFS is what you use, this is where you create it. Why am I telling you all this? Because your hyperconverged cloud can have all the services. You can consume any of these things from a dashboard. Really extremely simple to use. Okay. Now, that's all very cool, but 
it needs to land somewhere. I need an amount of persistent storage. So that's why software-defined storage plugs into the software-defined data center. So once I create all this stuff on demand, uh, based on consumption, or because I used it through an API or the dashboard or any other way, I need to do the exact same thing for storage. I can't wait for someone to create a blog device or an iSCSI device to tell me, oh, here's your blog device. Okay, you can use it now for your virtual machine that you created in 10 seconds. Um, so SUSE Enterprise Storage is uh, our solution to deploy a highly scalable, resilient environment with no single point of failures. It reduces IT cost because we use off-the-shelf servers and hard drives. We don't use or specify a specific hard drive that needs to be certified by the vendor that will cost $4 per gig versus um, two cents per gig. Um, and the important thing is that it automatically optimizes and adds storage as we need without disruption. Again, we use, you can use latest hardware. When you buy a cabinet from any traditional vendor, that's what you're stuck with. You have that cabinet that has a specific set of controllers. Those are the controllers you use. That technology, that firmware, the disk that were certified for that, <clears throat> for that storage. If there's a new release or a new version of storage, you're going to have to buy that and put it in the, in the rack besides your older storage. So with our technology, you can attach newer servers, newer technology, and add capacity <coughs> and aggregate, um, aggregate additional performance based on uh, new equipment. We provide hardware flexibility because you can buy Dell, uh, Supermicro, um, HP, you can buy any or Lenovo, mix and match, or you can do different versions of servers. Pretty much you could almost do anything you wanted. We have a reference architecture for Dell, reference architecture for Supermicro, uh, for S Cisco I believe we're working on, and for L Lenovo as well, HP as well. Okay, so these are some of the um, access methods that we provide as well. So you can use a native RBD uh, access method, which is Rados block device, which is in the Linux kernel, which provides immediate aggregate performance based on the size of your cluster. So with the other um, hyperconverged vendors, your storage actually decreases performance as you grow and our product actually increases performance as we grow. Because the more service we have, the more hard drives we have, the more aggregate we have. And once you're into the point of having six server and even nine servers, the uh, performance increase, it's exponential. Uh, we provide, of course, access for Hyper-V, iSCSI, uh, VMware as well. Um, our storage also has access for Swift, S3, uh, like Amazon S3. Um, uh, uh, its own uh, object device uh, access, iSCSI, and RBD. So let's actually look at the architecture. How does that, how do we eat that. Uh, and let me just try to move this. Okay. This is how that o open architecture looks like. We have a SUSE Enterprise, SUSE Linux Enterprise Server. And through SUSE Linux Enterprise Server, we have uh, KVM, which is the uh, Linux standard for virtualization. The service is called Nova Compute and Cinder. 
So block storage, persistent storage, compute is the actual scheduling framework we use for KVM. We use a DVR and an OVS, that is a distributed virtual um, routing, and open vSwitch. Then we have our local um, SATA drives and SSD drives. And we use, of course, SAF or SUSE Enterprise Storage for the um, flash cache or our pretty much back end, back, back end storage. So we, we can have a, a flash cache for um, commonly accessed storage for virtual machines as well. Um, and we can have a SATA uh, drives based uh, array of, of available uh, resources for lower cost uh, workloads. Then the, the data is replicated across all nodes. There's no shared storage. So if we lose a single server the other three nodes will have a copy of all our data. This including, if you choose to, um, the, the actual virtual machine as well. So anyone has used Amazon? Okay, so, so we have two ways to consume storage in the cloud, okay? Which is ephemeral storage, you create a virtual machine, you don't care about the virtual machine itself uh, or its storage, but that PostgreSQL database, you do care about that, so you attach storage and you mount it to var live PostgreSQL PGSQL data, right? Because that's what you care. You don't want to do a backup of the virtual machine, you don't want to do a backup of anything else perhaps, you just really care about your PostgreSQL database storage. So that storage can be um, plugged to the virtual machine, or if you're more traditional, you don't have any orchestration tools, you can put the entire virtual machine into persistent storage. Uh, that is actually what's, why Ceph was built, why Ceph was built to handle. So there's actually no concerns of performance, there's no bottlenecks, and like I said, the more, the more you grow, every single node <clears throat> becomes part of the storage cluster and there's more aggregate uh, performance towards, um, towards storage. Okay, so we covered our storage layer, a software-defined networking layer, uh, we'll get to more of that, and then our compute layer as well. Clients can access our cloud or our compute resources, um, and then they may also use storage and resources from iSCSI, block, object, and file storage. So you can share that NFS as a service, a object container, create iSCSI volumes and share them outside of your cluster um, and also provide a block access layer for other systems as well. Um, the reason this is up here, it's because you can also export any of the services outside of your hyperconverged environment. We don't want you in a bubble we don't want that you use any of these resources just for that isolated environment. You can create and allow other users and services to consume from that uh, conver hyperconverged environment. Okay. Let's, uh, let's talk about networking. So Open vSwitch is by far the most uh, use technology as well now uh, in regards to open source, um, cloud, and scalable systems. Uh, but 
very little people know about the distributed virtual router. So OVS is a multi-layer virtual switch. We design it for massive network automation. It separates tenants and its, and its segments. So if you create a user in your cloud and you don't want them to see, hear, or be even close to that other tenant, a software-defined networking, or OVS, will completely segregate uh, both users. You can do it, they can have different networks, or they can even be in the similar network, but in different segments, and they will not see each other. Uh, now, the distributed virtual router, it's implemented at the L3 level, that means that <clears throat> that same aggregate of servers, each one of them will become a router. If one server or if my main router or my endpoint routers are down, that's a single point of failure. If I have eight, 12, 15 servers in my hyperconverged environment in my cloud, they will all act as a router as well. So 15 of those 15 servers will actually have to be down so that you wouldn't be able to access data outside. Uh, this implements L3 routers across the compute nodes. It decentralizes network and the metadata, more specifically and very important, the metadata. Uh, then we talk about uh, Nova Compute. So it, it's the interface between the dashboard and the compute automation. And it supports Libbird, KVM, KMU, Zen, LXC. Um, although we support as hypervisors uh, KVM, Zen, uh, and then Hyper-V, VMware ESX, and Ironic Burr Metal. Um, it is schedules image deployment based on filters. So if we have 10 servers, and I create 12 virtual machines, the scheduler is gonna identify that it's not gonna put everything on the same node or the two nodes that are just there. It equally deploys infrastructure virtual machines across the available hardware in the best way possible. This is done by filtering between RAM, CPU, architecture of the servers, um, the hypervisor, because one system could be Zen, Another system could be KVM, and so on. Uh, it has all the important features. We can suspend, pause, snapshot, live migrate, power on, reboot, reset. You can do all this with, K with KVM uh, or Zen through the Nova automation. So in the dashboard, we click an instance, we live migrate that instance probably because uh, we want to do maintenance on the underlying host, or we're going to replace the host. Then it also automates key injection, automates configuration, IP address, DNS, everything. So today, when you want to create a virtual machine, for example, in, in VMware, you have that template, then you spin out that template. Um, you got to go to that, unless you've baked in automation within that template, you got to go into it, change the IP address, put the DNS, that uh, the DN you want, and kind of touch it a little bit so that it's production ready. Um, Nova handles that automatically. Through the dashboard, you choose a name, you click create, provides an IP address from the pool of IP addresses, and you're ready to go. Uh, then storage. So storage is scalable to the exabyte level. Self-healing, self-managed, and it's persistent storage. What's self-healing, self-managed? So we, if we have a cluster again, let's, let's put that on 10 nodes, and we pull one node down. Someone kicked the power, or a uh, motherboard went down, CPU died. Um, then we are not impacted by performance. Our data is not lost. There is a policy of data availability and durability, and data gets replicated across the other nine nodes. So we do not even notice. The operator is the only one that notice, of course, because they have to go in and, and identify why that server is powered off. 
It is the number one storage backend for OpenStack. All requests are automated by a dashboard, so we don't need a specific dashboard or another dashboard to create storage. The same dashboard where we created um, where we created a virtual machine or we create uh, a container or anything else, it's also the ones we the one we use to create persistent storage blocks. We can do replication or erasure coding. Erasure coding is the same as RAID. So data is striped across servers and then uh, there's some CPU consumption so that if two or three servers are killed at the same time, let's say because instead of kicking a cable, we kick a rack, um, that data would still be completely available and recoverable or recovers by itself. It would only, of course, because it's erasure coding, use CPU. It has to compute that lost data. File share as a service, native RBD and SCSI uh, protocols. And we know that already, we use standard hardware. So before I go into the, de into the demo, I gave you guys a lot of information, uh, but I think I repeated myself more than once. Any questions? Um, is anyone trying to implement high high, a hyper-converged environment? Are you here because you just wanted to understand the buzzword? Yes. I think so. I, I, I want to understand the buzzword. Okay. Uh, yes. This is uh, what I understand. Uh, this is what is, uh, uh, is is a part of the normal open site. You can create all those in any situation. Correct. Uh, yes and no. So we have to architect the hyperconverged environment uh, properly. Okay. So because you're in a single server, uh, you have to allocate memory for the storage processes. We have to allocate CPU and memory for your virtual machines. Again, this is done through the dashboard and it's just three clicks away. But we have to understand that um, because we're saving on data center footprint, we also need to understand that there's some buffer memory and there is certain resources that need to be limited. I have customers in New York City that tell me one server costs me three times as much as the actual server costs because I have to put it in a data center. Um, it's just too costly for them. They don't want to ship it to New, York, New Jersey. They don't want to ship it to Texas because, for example, in the financial industry, they want to be close to the data. They want to have more control, things like that. So data center footprint and keeping services in the same host makes a lot of sense for them. <coughs> Is there another question? Yes. So then, even though it's like create the hyperconverged environment, are you running um, the core controllers on, this, on all nodes as well then? Uh, let me see how fast I can. <laughs> I, I didn't, okay. So these are actually uh, mons. Is that is that what you were referring to? So the controller nodes are also Ceph monitor nodes. So we detach the dashboard and the controllers actually uh, separately. Everything else scales linearly. So those would be separate nodes that you have to add. It can be the it, it can be the same hardware, same model, same everything. Um, we just pull them outside of the entire uh, architecture. You can put them in there, but we don't we don't want to be you know pulling it too much. You know, it's uh, this is the it's the safest architecture um, in a in such an environment that's already sharing too many resources ac across everything. Yeah. Basically, the OpenStack controller nodes are also functioning as the sub monitors. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Um, how many, I guess, controllers would you say per node? 
is it just three to three? Or? The, the ratio, okay. Yeah, the so ratio? up to um, up to about a scale of um, 30 to 50 nodes in your architecture, you are fine with three controller nodes. Um, at the end of the day, you might be giving these a little bit more RAM than scaling to five. At the end of the day, we're, we're sharing very little um, uh, resources between them. Uh, there's really uh, a database uh, and the RabbitMQ configuration that pretty much is moving across should there be failure. So Ceph doesn't get faster by having five monitor nodes uh, and neither OpenStack by having five nodes. You could though have five in the scenario where you're already reaching 75, 100 servers or more so that if there is a failure, um, the, the database and RabbitMQ and the other resources running there actually never land in the same server. And so that's valuable because then performance would decrease. But uh, the three node configuration will, will last up until 50 nodes easily. Uh, it will also depend on the access. It could just be that you are in your cloud and you deployed a huge amount of VMs and workloads, but you're not making a lot of changes or a lot of users going in there, uh, then you don't need that. If you have a developer's cloud that they're removing uh, virtual machines every day or creating block devices and doing things very constantly, then we would scale that to five. But once you reach the level of 75, 80, 100 nodes at this level. Yes? Excuse me? No, so uh, no, we're those are our two next uh, features we're we're definitely working on. So, hmm? right, yes. So so Susie Enterprise Storage uh, has actually a replication mechanism inside, so you don't have it's not like a RAID. Uh, you actually can replicate data internally. Um, so you can have a backup within, by, by replicating the data additionally, you can have uh, the data replicated within. If you wanted to do a backup externally, uh, you can also plug to SUSE Enterprise Storage, which is the same architecture. The question is, once you use such a low cost but performing technology as Susie Enterprise Storage, um, where do you do your backup? To a tape? So if you look at the price of tape and how much our storage might be, it's actually, it, it's, it's not gonna go that much lower. Um, so you could perform a backup to the same location uh, or you can create a backup to another Susie Enterprise Storage cluster Target workloads. Um, like, do you need to have what? That's that's ideal, but no, we have customers uh, that run SAP on an OpenStack. Uh, SAP the SAP Hana Cloud is part of it, OpenStack. So, um, yes, yes, so, so before they weren't, because there wasn't a persistent storage backend, and then, so Amazon, five years ago, they were telling you, 
you're doing everything wrong. You need to recreate how you're doing things and your workloads have to scale out and they have to be um, pretty much cloud friendly. So that if an Amazon node died, your application wasn't affected because you had a load balancer, you had all this services in front, right? So at the beginning of OpenStack, that was true as well because we had no HA built in, we had no compute HA either, and the storage couldn't really be, um, uh, it, it, it was a manual process to, to pretty much put an application back on shape. That's no longer the case. So we have a, uh, uh, the controller backplane, it's all um, highly available. Then the compute services are now highly available. So if an application fails, it's actually started on another node as well. And because of the SUSE Enterprise Storage backend, every node has access to all the, all the storage as well. But because it's, um, it's orchestrated through APIs, through the information in the database, and everything else, it knows where to collect that information, move it something, somewhere else. Uh, so we've already done all that. And no, you don't need cloud native applications only to run here. You can, you can run um, a database. You can run SAP. We, we have some guys doing crazy stuff here. So it's, we're normally, we are normally very safe and conservative. Our customers aren't. Uh, and, and that's fine because once they make the decision, we help them do all those crazy things they want to do and, and it works great. And then there are the advocates of that technology. They feel proud of that. And they actually come here and talk about it. I'm sorry. Yes, some questions. First, you, uh, are you able to spread, spread the resources in the physical machine uh, for compute or for storage, for instance, I think Logan said needs a, a guaranteed amount of memory and process in the moment. Yeah. How do you uh, ensure that uh, OpenStack won't create too much too many machines in the uh, Right. So so there's there's a resource isolation um, that um, it's actually coming in Sosy OpenStack Cloud Seven which is due in uh, no, like uh, two weeks or I don't know, uh, this year, right? So, so that actually comes with a, a resource allocation for SUSE Enterprise Storage. Uh, then there is a Nova allocation for CPUs and dedicated um, memory for Nova as well so that they're not eating resources between each other. Now, yes, granted. Is it the same machine? Is it the same host you can isolate? Yes. Yes, that's, that's, that's the whole idea. Now, um, uh, granted, that is a buffered architecture. Um, if you understand that and appreciate the decreased data center footprint, um, you're going to be fine, you know, leaving 16, 24 gigs of RAM for buffer so that uh, services, you know, they don't touch each other. So you're, you're saving a lot of, um, of money by not buying an additional server, but you are wasting a little bit of money by leaving certain RAM resources uh, for, for all the services, right? Uh, compared to a solution that uses the, uh, the firmware of storage, uh, how less machines can you run in a, in a application like this? How much do you expand for the, for, for the convergence of the availability? Um, actually, actually, there shouldn't be an impact because your traditional OpenStack compute node has two hard drives. They just make a RAID and then they run the virtual machines of those two hard drives. And they, and they do that just because one hard drive might die. 
else they would just use one hard drive. Um, but everything else, it's actually used through the storage that's directly attached to the compute nodes. So, which is simply being orchestrated to the layer of Ceph. Um, so I wouldn't say that you can do less. You wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so besides a little bit of RAM and, and not really over utilizing virtual CPUs, um, you're not losing anything else. Yeah. Go ahead. So I can show you, uh, this is actually on Dell 730 XDs. Um, the systems have um, two, two CPUs. Uh, they were actually repurposed hardware from, from Dell. So Dell had um, hardware that came scratched to a customer. And then the customer said, no, it's scratched. I paid for a proper box. And then they sent it back. So instead of costing $10,000, it cost me 4000 um, I'll take it. So um, uh, it's it's brand new hardware. It's just that it was returned. Um, so 730 Dell 730XDs, uh, fully populated with SATA drives, and then each one has uh, two SSD drives for journaling. Uh, you can also use SSD drives for uh, ephemeral storage, just because you want to run virtual machines. Uh, there as well, and make them run run faster. You're already saving on servers. You can you can put some money on the hard drives. Um, yet I run on SATA drives, and I actually have a this hyperconverged configuration which I've been using for a year. Uh, it's the lab that all the SEs in North America use. So they go in there and they do all the crazy stuff that people want us to do. Um, it's running also a Cloud Foundry implementation on top, which is pretty big. And I've never had to reboot a single node uh, since that. Um, I, I think it's, it's pretty, excuse me? <coughs> I'm sorry, it's, um, that's only 10 nodes. Yeah. So um, for the storage, like mm -hmm. we rewrote the 730s and 930s. Okay. Um, I don't like SD cards because I've, yeah, because I've, I've been to customers and, yeah. So I would, so the 730 XDs have two drives on the back. And what I did is I plugged in two small SSD drives on the back. I use that. I don't want to lose an entire server just because the SD card got bad or the, right? So... So I use, a, right, right. So you need to replace, reboot, yeah. So those are silly things I think we, we do to minimize cost, but um, that we could change. Uh, I, I, I was using a SATA drive before, and then I rated those SATA drives. So it's, it's, 100, it's $130 hard drive that if it just dies, it brings down all this other stuff. Um, yeah, but you can. Uh, we have a reference architecture on the 730XDs. I don't know if we have anything with the 930, uh, but I... I well, the 930 is the SATA card supplier. Right, okay. Because we run them for free as well. And okay. The green card would run on the 730s. Okay, yeah. So the 730XD also has a uh, more expensive architecture that you can do 24 uh, SSD drives or 2.5 drives in the front. Um, that kicked up my price a little bit, so I just I just did 12 drives uh, within, and because it was cheaper. That's what I had. Yeah. Do you have like a spare concept if one machine dies completely and needs a little bit more time to cover? And your capacity is full. Uh, right, right. So um, the recommended 
setup is that once you're reaching 80% utilization, you should be already begging for more hardware. Um, so if you reach 90, 95% utilization, you're already in a critical state, pretty much. Um, but if you have a NetApp box and you reach a 95% utilization, you're in big trouble anyway as well. Uh, but would you recommend to have a spare system on the side, or <coughs> you say as long as you don't hit the 80%, it's, it's fine? And 80% um, depends on how large your hypervisors are. Right, right, 80%. 80%. Big machines, 80% Correct. So if you have if you have four nodes, so if you one goes down and you're at eighty percent, you're in big trouble. Okay. Yes. Uh, so that's why we also have we have one reference architecture for the Apollo hardware. The Apollo hardware is is a thing this big. It's extremely good hardware. Um, there are different models, and I like to. Pitch the one, the 42. Uh, yes, because you can put in 24 hard drives, I think 36. Is this one you're talking to 2000? Where you have four nodes in the back of it? Well, that's actually a little bit too big. Uh, that, that one can have like 64 hard drives. Uh, no, that, that, that's different. This one's the Apollo 2000. Oh, okay. It's got four. Ah, yes, OK. And then you got 24 drives across. So it's like a, a converged in a, single, in a single server. Yeah, OK. Um, those are fine. I don't know how many hard drive slots they have. There, there's 24 total. So you can either okay. give six to each node, okay. or you can buy the 2800 where you can divvy up the drives. And that's in a three year or a four year? Two year. Oh, a two year. Wow, that's, that's good as well. So, so that's, that's, that's good use, I guess. Um, so back to that, if you buy like a, a power box with 64 hard drives, and instead of scaling out a little bit, you keep scaling up, one node goes down, one motherboard goes down, you're going to be in big trouble. So that conversation is very important when you're architecting this. But this is, this is things you go through a checkbox and you make sure you don't do. It's a five minute conversation with regards to that architecture. But yes, it's a good point. Yes? Do you use any, have you tried any form of cache for the disk? Yeah. Yes, we, we have a cache tier. You can create a cache tier and use that as the, as the backing pool. Set, uh, the, set, the cache yes. Yeah, there's a cache tier. And it supports it supports the whole thing of uh um I I forgot the words right now, but um it's it's based on it's based on, on access so that if uh if, if an object is not accessed within let's say the same one hour, then it gets there's another word, but it's expelled or yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so that then that data gets expelled from the cache steer, and until there's need again, it gets back into the cache steer. But um, cache steer takes time to settle because it's an algorithm, uh, and it needs it needs to happen, right? So you need users to start accessing the virtual machines. By the time it settles, uh, let's say a day. Um, the most used virtual machines will have the most, um, correct, the, it's, it's a cash tier, right? You can't afford to pay SSD for everything, so whoever it's most popular. How many uh, virtual SSDs for? Okay, for each SATA drive, we recommend one SSD for journal, for journaling. Uh, if you wanna do cash steering, then it's going to depend on how much data access you have. So let's say in an hour you access 20 terabytes um, of, 
of your storage, okay? So you're gonna want to have at least double that amount. So if you are accessing 20 terabytes, you wanna have um, 40, 60 terabytes of that cached here. But the, the ratio is that, um, two to three times the amount of what you access in an hour. Yeah. It's just, it's just storage, yeah. You're, you're already going, I'm not, I don't wanna say cheap, or inexpensive on the rest of the equipment or the um, consolidation and everything. So sometimes we have to uh, invest in certain SSD drives so that our implementation is it's good. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, with let's say a 10 node cluster with um, standard hardware, uh, a gig can, per year, can cost you 10 cents. It's, it's pretty cheap. And, and you know, the money that SUSE gets out of this whole thing, it's more like three or 4%. All that money is actually going to the hardware vendor because that's, that's actually the expensive part. Open source software, we're just providing support and maintenance. We're providing, of course, the, the whole knowledge behind, behind the implementation but it goes to the hardware. So choosing the right hardware is good so that you don't have to uh, deal with a lot of things. I don't know how much time I have, so I'm just gonna jump into the actual demo. Um, any other question before that? Oh, okay. So this is, oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, this is a SUSE OpenStack Cloud, it's gonna look ugly because I'm making it bigger, but you probably can see. So I have actually uh, my administration, and in my scenario, I actually have the monitor nodes uh, included into the hyper-converged infrastructure. It's not what we recommend for an architecture you wanna to grow to 25 or 50 nodes, but because I'm not gonna get more money to buy more nodes, that's what I'm gonna do. <laughs> Um, okay, so um, the way we work is uh, a node gets installed into the rack, you connect all the cables, you power it on, it actually gets PXC booted into our deployment framework. Then you click allocate and slash 12 service pack one gets installed. Then it shows up here with this green color, of course. We go into the bar clamps and we choose which services we want to deploy on those nodes. So for example, in our Ceph uh, cluster, I have a uh, replication set to two. I, I like to keep my, my, my replica set to two. Uh, then I can choose which nodes are monitors. So this one, I simply drag and drop and put it into Ceph Mon. Uh, Ceph OSDs, I can also drag and drop them. You can see that uh, Ceph Mon 1 is a Ceph monitor and it's also a Ceph OSD. You can also implement Rados gateways. Rados gateways are the uh, uh, nodes that acts as a, as a, a gateway for S3 and Swift access protocols. Does anyone know S3, like Amazon S3? Okay, and Swift, okay, fair. So all I do, really, and let me just show you, I don't, maybe this is gonna give an error, but there, that's it, that's all I do, I drag and drop. Uh, and then we click apply, and the proposal gets applied. Then let's move to uh, another service, which is Nova. Again, that is our, um, that is our, our compute service, compute scheduling service that deploys our hypervisor. So I can change here RAM over commitment. I could set this to 1.1 and then we're actually ballooning or we're, we're doing RAM over committing. Uh, then we can set a virtual CPU to one socket CPU ratio. So for every socket I have, 
how many virtual CPUs do I want OpenStack to see? Um, that's the ratio as well that we're configuring. If we are running um, applications or if we're running customers that are really picky about performance, we want to share less. We want to decrease this so that systems actually have more CPU uh, cycles. Uh, with uh, SUSE Enterprise, uh, SUSE OpenStack Cloud, there's going to be an additional field here that has the memory allocation um, so that we're saving memory for the storage processes as well. Uh, in my case, I've actually done it manually in our chef, re chef recipe, but so it's going to open stack cloud, it's going to be here. So it's a configurable value. Uh, we can enable lib, um, live migration. So we grab our virtual machine, and I'll actually show you. We also have KVM uh, kernel same page merging. So if we have 10 Linux, uh, SUSE Linux Enterprise Service running, running the same kernel, running the same code, and there are 10 virtual machines, uh, there's actually a shared code that is just the same across systems. And this will actually merge that memory and helps to save uh, on RAM consumption. So it's just merging memory. If we wanted to configure a VMware integration, we could do it here as well. Uh, and ZVM for those uh, mainframe users. And this is where we configure the hypervisor. Every single node, I want it to be a KVM node. Mon one, two, three, and the four nodes I have here. Again, drag and drop. And then we click apply. Uh, and there's one more thing, which uh, is Neutron. Neutron allows me to see the, uh, uh, the different drivers we have configured. And we can configure OpenStack, uh, OVS, DVR, dynamic virtual uh, router, and then all access to compute and networking requests is going to be shared across all the nodes. Let's actually have a look at OpenStack. Has, has anyone looked at OpenStack before? OK, fair. I'm happy to see more hands. Before, I used to not see that many hands. Um, so then you're, you're maybe familiar. I'm actually here in my uh, Cloud Foundry project. Um, very slow uh, Wi-Fi here. Let me, let me just switch here to a SUSE project. Um, I can create instances. And I'm going to call this uh, HCI demo. And we're going to make that medium from image slash 12 SP1. Uh, we're going to play it risky and allow all. And fixed. So we created that virtual machine. Okay. Now we're also going to go ahead and create a volume. And it's going to be, I don't know, a 10 gig volume. ATI. Well, create volume. And we're going to manage attachments, attach that volume, volume to HCI demo. And there it is. So the, the storage has been attached as dev VDB to our instance um, HCI demo. We can actually see that it's already provisioned, um, and it's it's booting up. Uh, then I blame any slow lifts on systemd. 
Like I blame everything on system B. Um, so at, at this point, we took that glance image or that image of repository image from Suzy Enterprise Storage. Because of our aggregate performance, um, it got copied over to that compute node. There was an RBD device attached to that. We added an additional storage component there. Um, and our instance is actually going to get, um, it's going to get an IP address and it's going to get uh, a DNS name as well. Hold on a second. We can associate a floating IP address. And that's on uh, in here. So there we go. So we created, uh, so just by creating the name of the virtual machine, uh, there is a actual DNS entry. It has an IP address, has its own storage. It has also persistent storage on the side, uh, 10 gig uh, volume we attached. Uh, not only that, but through our SUSE manager integration, if I uh, simply log in here to SUSE manager, and I hope nobody has messed with this, uh, SEs do crazy things. Uh, let's see. Let's see if it's up and running. Okay. There it is, HCI demo. Geekoland is our domain. So does anyone know who's Geeko? Our chameleon, yeah? It's actually, People are saying it's not called that way anymore. I don't care what they say. Um, so now, in SUSE Manager, we can actually control those instances and patch them, visualize more what's going on. With our SALT integration tool, we can do configuration management, orchestrate, we can do all the crazy things again that people want us to do. But then again, I just wanted to show you our hyperconverged infrastructure uh, deployment. That's how you um, configure node, uh, com compute storage and networking on the same node. Um, anything else can also be done. Of course, there's not enough time here. Um, here's, here's what is different from the three other vendors I show you uh, at the beginning of the presentation. There are other vendors that sell support and maintenance for OpenStack. There are other vendors that sell and support Ceph. There's no other vendor that sells support for VMware or Hyper-V. So we talk about vendor lock-in, OpenStack, Ceph, Linux, it's by far the choice. Any questions? Okay, so you're definitely going to see me around. If you have any questions or want me to show you something else, let me know, okay?